we all want our students to be very engaged, and moreover, we want them to be really be able to learn deeply. And by learning deeply, I just mean that you can give justification, you can give causal explanations after you've learned about the content that you've just learned. And sometimes people call this learning critically, deeply. So I'm excited to share with you today a brand new framework that um, is evidence-based, and this framework clarifies what it means to be engaged and proposes there are multiple ways students could be engaged, and moreover, some ways are better for deep learning than other ways. So this promising framework, at least it has a promise, of giving concrete prescriptions to teachers and to any instructors so that we can elicit uh, better or more improved engagement from students. So what I want you to do today as you listen is either take some notes on a piece of paper or take some notes on your uh, laptop, and, but don't uh, copy what I have on the PowerPoints. So what is an engaged learner? Typically, we think of an engaged learner as someone who's on task or off task. And practitioners think this, laymen think this, and researchers think this. That is, someone who's off task is easy to tell, right? You can see that they're goofing around, um, not looking at you, looking, doing something else, zoning out. And we can also tell who's an on task learner, somebody who's paying attention to you. As this cartoon illustrates, uh, the teacher says, Einstein, stop goof, uh, fooling around, pay attention. That's our typical concept. However, what we want to do is expand the notion of on-task learning from just on-task to some four other modes that we can see equally easily what students are doing. That is, we can see by what they're doing behaviorally how they're engaging. So the first mode is the passive mode, which I call passive, that is, it's the paying attention mode. And that's the mode in which the students are not doing anything, but they are oriented towards you, looking at you. And this is associated with a potential cognitive process of just storing information directly. That is, this is the mode that we think about when people pour information in. Oops. The second mode is what I call the manipulative mode, in which students are actually doing something with instructional materials, such as underlining, highlighting. They could be in a lab measuring, pouring. So the unique feature about this mode is that you're physically manipulating something, but you're not adding anything new to the instructional materials. And we call this mode the active mode. And so what the active mode does, cognitively perhaps, is that whatever you're manipulating such what, whatever sentences you're underlining activates prior knowledge that you have. So that allows you to at least integrate the new information for what you already know. So the third mode is what we call the generative mode. And in this mode, you simply generate something new beyond what was presented to you. You're not making ma major discoveries. You're just making little inference beyond what was given. So for example, if a teacher asks you to compare two examples, compare two cases, what you came up with, similarity and differences with the two cases, is what you cre created that's new. And so we call this a constructive mode, and associated with this constructive mode are probably processes like making inferences besides integrating, activating. And finally, we have the collaborative mode in which we can actually see two students working together. However, we can't really tell whether when two students are working together, they're really truly collaborative. And what we mean by that is that each student must be constructive on their own. In addition, they must be constructive or generative on top of what their partner created. So when they are truly co-constructive or mutually co-constructive, they can actually generate new information that neither can, of them can generate alone. So you can see that potentially collaborative mode is the most powerful, but it must be executed properly. And that's a difficult thing to teach uh, people to do, and we're working on that. So what do these four modes mean? Based on the content processes, these four modes actually generate hypotheses that we call the ICAP hypothesis. That means that interactive is better than constructive, better than active, and better than passive. And this is an evidence-based hypothesis because we actually can take hundreds of studies out that's already published studies that others have published, and we map the conditions of these studies to correspond to each of these modes. And you can see that the results of those studies uh, confirm our hypothesis. So we call this the ICAP hypothesis. So what does this mean for uh, what should we tell teachers to do? And what could we tell students to do? So remember earlier I told you to take notes? 
Well, now you know that taking notes is a more generative task. And I told you not to copy notes. Copy is an active task. So if you did take notes today, I'm confident that you will walk away knowing how to encourage your students to be more constructive, and you will be rewarded with students who learn more deeply. Thank you.